So uh, first thing I wanted to do, because this, this effort uh, was really a team effort, and I wanted to recognize these folks, including Cheryl. Uh, uh, they're part of a, the, a group called the Residents Working to Improve Jersey Village. Uh, they're very active in Jersey Village, but they also were instrumental in uh, helping us get this drone survey done. So I want to thank all of them. So we're going to cover uh, a number of things. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to show you the project area, talk a little bit about the background and history. Uh, uh, for those who are not familiar with drones in this context, I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about just the components of drones, uh, how they're used in terms of photogrammetry and elevation modeling, um, talk a little bit about the equipment we use, the, uh, the planning and the design of this survey, uh, ground control points. The last speaker talked about ground control points. Ground control points are very, very important, so I'm going to spend a minute on, on those. Uh, also, uh, how we tie the survey back into the Harris County flood plain reference marks, and I'll, I'll show some of that, um, and talk a little bit about drone and aerial mapping survey, software that was used, the workflow, and also some what we're what I'm calling actionable data products examples from the survey, from the survey and how they were used uh, to interpret the data. So um, just to kind of put this area in context, this is the Harris County watershed map, and so this is the uh, the project area uh, uh, located in Jersey Village. Yeah, this is a blow up, this is a Google Earth blow up of the project area. So we, we shot a survey basically along the White Oak Bayou, the main channel, this uh, bypass. We, across, uh, we, we stopped here and we shot uh, the uh, rest of the survey on the uh, east side of the uh, Go A. And so just for scale, this is about a mile. So we're talking about a much smaller scale project than the White Oak study. Um, in terms of terminology, again, this is the project area. Um, we'll refer to the bypass uh, quite a bit. And, and then this is the main uh, White Oak uh, Bayou channel. Oh, and, and just a, a note, uh, the channels above and below Jersey Village are large, but narrower through Jersey Village. And this is an important aspect of this, this study. Uh, these are some drone images of the, of the bypass, so you get an idea of what it looks like from the air. This is a little bit lower uh, elevation. Um, in terms of uh, some background and history, so Jersey Village has experienced flooding issues since 1998 when 300 homes were flooded. Uh, they flooded again in, in 2001 during Tropical Storm Allison. 2002, and most recently during the tax day flood in 2016. So citizens committees have been formed several times to bring awareness to the problem and suggest real solutions. Citizens, again, Jersey Village citizens observed the bypass, particularly after the tax day flood, was not performing as efficiently and felt that it should, uh, it should, and that silting uh, may have ch changed the grade of the channel from its original slope. And it's, it's to help, I uh, guess, uh, you know, uh, verify this, uh, Raptor Aerial Services was contacted to perform the drone aerial survey to determine if this or other issues were the causes. Um, before I talk about the drones, um, we shot this survey in August right before Harvey. So I mean, we were, timing-wise, we were in pretty good shape, but uh, it was hot, and I'll, that'll, that'll come to play here in a few minutes, too. Uh, just the basic components of a drone. Now, there's lots of different kinds of drones, uh, but this, we used a quadcopter. Uh, it has a uh, very high-resolution camera on it, a 20-megapixel camera. Uh, yeah, these, all these drones, these quadcopter drones, uh, are GPS-enabled, have, have quite accurate GPS. Uh, you have a remote controller, usually some sort of device like an iPad uh, that runs the software that does both the planning and actually drives the drones. And uh, they, they run off LiPo batteries and they usually have a, well, they have an SD card on board to capture all the imagery. 
Um, uh, basically, drones are very similar to using aircraft for doing photogrammetry and, and elevation modeling, except they're flying at a they're flying at a much lower elevation, and uh, and so and the, and there are limitations. The quadcopter drones, particularly, you're not going to do you know a 10,000 square mile survey. They're typically used in a more local sort of thing. But it's the same concept. You're shooting images, many, many images that, that overlap, and they get processed and stitched together. And so, and we'll show some products of that uh, later on. So this is the drone equipment that we use. We use the GGI Phantom 4 Pro. Um, it's a typical, you know, typical quadcopter, and very similar to the setup from the previous slide. We have a, a 20 megapixel uh, camera. It's also capable of 4K video. Um, I mentioned ground control points, and, and again, those who are not familiar with aerial surveys, these ground control points are critical in terms of ha getting accurate results, spatially, both in, in both horizontal and vertical aspects. So in, in the case of this survey, as is typical with ground control points, we use 48-inch vinyl black and white targets, and we survey each one of those ground control points in with um, very accurate surveying equipment, portable surveying equipment, using uh, what's called an RTK network. So we got accuracies uh, down to about two centimeters, you know, about, a, about an inch or so, inch to two inches horizontally, and about two to four inches vertically. But these, these are very important in terms of doing any of this kind of aerial survey work. Uh, this, uh, this is the equipment that was used. It's an EOS AeroGo RTK surveying equipment. It's beautiful. It's really made well. It's very portable. Uh, you've got an antenna, a receiver, and then it uses, a, it uses Bluetooth and talks to an iPad where the software is, is running. It's really, really good equipment and uh, very robust, and, and I really enjoy using it, actually. So this is typically the way ground control points are surveyed. So this is what a target might look like. The, uh, in this case, they're 48 inches by 48 inches. They have generally some sort of reference, a number or letter or something to differentiate the ground control points. And you survey right at the point, right in the middle uh, of the uh, target. Again, using, in this case, the EOS uh, Arrow Gold equipment. Um, I mentioned that we're going to talk a little bit about the Harris County uh, floodplain reference marks. Uh, these are existing. There's a whole network of these reference marks. And uh, so we wanted to make sure the, the survey we did tied back to these reference marks. And so we, we spent some time and effort to make sure that that was done. And these are the four reference marks that we surveyed and we tied back into it. Here's the, the move box shows the, uh, the project area. <laughs> and these are what the uh, actual reference marks look like. A couple examples, they're typically in at least the Jersey Village area, they're typically on these bridges that cross these, the channels or the volume. And you can go on the website and every, for every one of these reference marks they have data sheets uh, that have all the, the positioning data uh, available. And how you know what what reference system they used to to survey the reference mark. So this was you know vital in terms of tying back into the uh, these uh, reference marks. Uh, the software that we used uh, we used Google Earth Pro or Google Earth for planning. That's pretty pretty common. It's a great tool. Obviously, a lot a lot of people use Google Earth, but for planning purposes for an aerial survey, it's it vital. Uh, in this case, although there's a number of software packages, I use Drone Deploy for mission planning. Uh, there's other packages like Pix4D and, uh, and others that you can use for doing a drone-based uh, survey. Uh, I use a number of software packages related to the surveying equipment. Uh, uh, DJI has an app called Go4 where we set the drone settings, we do a compass calibration, and we set all the camera settings for that. Um, once the the drone survey was flown, the images were captured. I use a, uh, instead of ArcGIS, which a lot of people use, Esri ArcGIS, I use a Blue Marbles Global Mapper as my GIS, uh, GIS system. I use it for general mapping and also a lot of the surface analytics uh, and hard copy generation and so forth. 
Um, I also uh, use a product called Virtual Surveyor. Uh, it's a great visualization tool. You can do 3D measurements and uh, you can create things like 3D flyovers through the data and I've got an example of that. And then just some other typical products. Uh, this is a, it's a sort of a, 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 a uh, sort of generalized workflow. You plan these missions, you design the survey, you lay out the survey in all the ground control points, uh, you do uh, perform pre-flight checks, and uh, obviously initiate takeoff, you fly and capture the images. The images then are, are uploaded, you can either, depending on what software you're using, you can either upload them to a cloud service and have them all stitched together, or uh, you can run them locally on a desktop like pix 4 d And then once you've generated all the products, and the products are like ortho mosaics, visual surface elevation models, 3D models, and so forth, you then can export these uh, files and then import them into like GIS and systems and so forth. It's a pretty streamlined, actually, uh, process. And this is just uh, taking that workflow and putting it into words. But one thing I wanted to mention is, uh, as part of this project, we also generated uh, large format hard copies, and we did a lot of this work before we generated profiles and cross sections uh, using uh, Global Mapper, and that became very important in terms of the ter interpretation. Uh, the survey specs, uh, the area was about 273 acres total. Uh, we initially laid out 18 ground control points. Uh, Apparently somebody lifted one of them, so we actually only used 17 at the end of the day. Um, never could find the 18th file. <laughs> I looked for it, though. I looked for it on the imagery end. <laughs> uh, we flew the, uh, those who are familiar with drones, the FAA does not allow you to fly over 400 feet, what's called AGL, above ground level, without it. I mean, you can get a waiver, and there's, there are ways to do it, but typically not. So you find these, these drone-based aerial surveys at a much lower elevation above the ground. The good thing about that is it generates a much higher resolution uh, image and data. We flew them at 80% uh, side lap, 80% uh, front lap. Uh, we used the 20 megapixel camera on, that was built into the drone. The results, so we ended up with 0.9 inches per pixel resolution, what's called ground space ground sample distance resolution. That's about two centimeters per pixel. That's what the resolution ended up being. We broke the uh, survey into three sections. And the reason we did that is uh, the FAA has a requirement call, called line of sight. And so uh, I typically do not fly my drones over half a mile. I, you know, even though they're rated to fly four miles or whatever, they could, you end up having problems with the, with the remote controller or the drone. So we typically don't fly them over, but over a half a mile. Uh, but if you do get to a point where you fly it beyond line of sight, you have to have what are called visual observers. And communication with, between the pilot and the visual observers. And in this case, the western section, we had to do that. And we, so we had some visual observers with body talkies. And so we were always had the, uh, the drone in uh, visual contact. We did two passes each. Uh, we did a, basically a perpendicular grid pattern. I'll show that in just a second. So this is just the western section that we shot. So we did a, a parallel uh, pattern, and then we did a perpendicular pattern. And we did that for the entire uh, project area. Uh, it does a couple things. One is, you know, that, in my opinion anyways, and other people's opinion, it just generates a more detailed product. Plus, I think the previous speaker had mentioned the, the, the fact that the, whether it's an airplane or a drone, they don't fly exactly perfect. And so this helps mitigate some of that per perturbations in the drone itself. Uh, this is the uh, layout of the ground control points. So we physically laid out targets. This is the whole project area. And this is in Google Earth. So you can see where the location of all the ground control points are. Uh, we originally had, had 18 of them laid out. Uh, we tried to not only distribute them uh, horizontally uh, across the whole project area, we also wanted to get different elevations. So we tried to put them in different parts of the bayou and the channel. So we got a good, good distribution. Uh, <clears throat> here's us uh, serving in one of the ground control points and uh, 
And this is the, the day we flew. Uh, we actually flew the day before, and it was so hot that the iPad wouldn't work. And so it was over, I think it was 104 degrees. And so we ended up coming back the next morning and we put a little easy up uh, top and you know, just do anything we could to keep the equipment cool. The drum flew fine, but it was, it was really hot that day. So this is what I mean by teamwork. I mean, we had a, we had a group of individuals that uh, we, were, we were out there sweating and, and uh, but having fun at the same time. Um, so I'm going to show some what I call actionable data products examples. Uh, ortho mosaic, which is also called an ortho photo mosaic, which is like a large, essentially all these many, many hundreds or thousands of images are stitched together in a single like photograph. The beauty of this stuff is it's all geo-referenced, and so you just basically plug that image into a GIS system and it, and it matches perfectly with the, with the surrounding data. Uh, we did a digital surface elevation model. The previous speaker mentioned digital elevation model. This is a little different. This is not LIDAR, and so there is a little bit of vegetation effect. We don't know how much it was, but we think there's probably some, even though the bayou was mowed. Uh, so it, it, it does the surface. So if there were any buildings or trees, you'll see, you'll actually see how it, how it works with that. Uh, we did a train model. Uh, uh, I'm going to show a, a little 3D flyover movie that's created from the data, not actually a video, although it looks like a video. And then uh, just some examples of profiles and cross-sections that we generated. So this is the, this is the ortho photo mosaic, and so you can, you can see how well the, the data ties with the existing uh, imagery. And so this, was, this clearly shows the project area that we shot. This is the uh, digital surface elevation model. And again, the, the, here's a little bit of a legend. The, the dark, dark blue is lower elevation, and the, 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 the orange, yellows, and, and reds are much higher elevation. These are the trees and palms and so forth. But even from the, the, the in, just looking visually at the imagery, in this digital surface elevation model, you can see differences in the, in the main channel and the bayou, uh, and, and over in this part of the bayou. And so it's, it's, this is what we use to do all the profiles and cross-sections, but, but it also visually is a good tool. Um, as I mentioned, we, we created a, a train model. This is a train model just of the western section. Uh, these tools, once you get it into this type of format, these tools allow you to do very, very accurate measurements. You can do lengths, you can do areas, you can do volumes. Um, you can do slope, uh, color slope displays, you can do lots of things with the data. My point with this, this was a, this was a video where, where we, it's, but, but the, um, not a video, okay? it's a 3D flyer where we movie through the data. And so when you actually look at the details that come from the data, it looks like a, a 4K video. And so, it's, uh, unfortunately, I can't show it to you yet. But um, it's uh, it's one of the things you can do once you get this data created. One of the one of the products you can generate. And for explaining to people and showing people what these things, you know, what these areas look like, it's a really invaluable tool. I'm sorry, I can't show it to you though. Um, I mentioned that uh, we generated a lot of profiles and cross sections. So. This is the um, this is the digital surface elevation model in, in the bottom, and the yellow line here shows the profile that's generated up here. So this is coming directly from the elevation model. So you can see the amount of detail uh, that uh, comes from the, this data. And a couple things I wanted to mention uh, in this particular bio: uh, this blue line that was hand drawn in here. That's the bottom of the bypass from the original construction plans that, uh, from 2009. So that, that shows this. The red line is the bottom of the bypass from the individual cross section, so the, from the drone survey itself. So, and you can see a couple of things here. One is there's a difference uh, of about one and a half, maybe two feet. We don't know, you know, we, there's, 
We just know there's a difference, uh, but it, we think it's pretty significant. And also you can kind of see from here to here, you can see this is pretty flat. And then it sort of tapers off in this direction, affecting probably the efficiency of that body to, to, to drain and, and the water to flow. And so, you know, this is one of the, the findings that we got from the room survey. And this is a, a cross section, and this again is the uh, digital surface elevation model. Here is the, the, the cross section line, and you can kind of see a profile, a very accurate profile of the or cross section of the, uh, the bayou at this point. And so we did a lot of these, and this is the type of analysis that was done uh, to generate uh, some results. So, wrapping up. So the drone aerial survey accomplished its mission. Uh, the results of the survey indicated that the current bottom of the tr channel is flatter than originally constructed. Uh, it is one and a half to two feet higher than the original plan. This is mo most likely due to sedimentation or silting and makes the bypass work, work less efficiently than originally designed. And keep in mind that sort of the flooding history of this, this area. Uh, the survey did generate a lot of attention, which resulted in the bypass channel being desilted by the Harris County Flood Control District. And, and really, the, one of the things, messages I wanted to, to, to for you all to take away is drone, drones are another tool. Uh, these, these, you know, I know, you know, some people think they're toys, but they're real working tools. And uh, they can be used, very useful for this type of work. Um, this is a picture, this is post-survey and and, but this is a picture of a couple of pictures of some work that is being done or has been done by the Harris County Flood Control District. So they, they did. Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. So they did uh, do some uh, minor desilting and maintenance of the of the bypass. And then uh, just to finish up, uh, and I'm saying this on behalf of the citizens group. Uh, the Harris County Flood Control District and, and County Commissioner Jack Cable's office have been very receptive to our citizens group throughout the existence, uh, throughout its existence since 2016, allow, allowing numerous face-to-face uh, -face meetings and, uh, with them and responding to many questions and comments. We wish to thank them for their openness and assistance. And then I just want to thank the HGS for putting on this conference. And that's it. Any questions? Yes. Or, I just had a quick one. What, the, what would be the investment cost, Chris, in that? What would be the investment cost in terms of the equipment? The, Approximately. Uh, depending on what you, you're buying. I mean, what you bought. Yes. Yeah, well, the, um, the the survey kit that I have are probably about two grand total, and then the survey equipment is the expensive part. That's a probably an eight or nine thousand dollar investment. So it's you could you can probably get this whole setup for maybe oh uh, twelve thousand somewhere in that that neighborhood, ten to twelve thousand. Yeah. And that includes the drone. That includes the drone. That that particular one. If you notice, I have this drone up here. This, uh, the Phantom 4 Pro is what's called a prosumer drone. It's a very, very good drone. It's nice and small and portable. I typically use now what's called an Inspire 2. It's a bigger drone. It has more camera options and also has much better battery life. And so when you start getting up into this range and higher, now you're talking about several thousand dollars for drones. But drones can be very cost effective, very cost effective. Uh, I was just wondering, <clears throat> this looks like a pretty uh, good tool for looking at the status of drainage ditches. Mm -hmm. And has Harris County Flood Control District ever approached you about doing a survey of the drainage systems or anything? Not, not me specifically. I don't know. <laughs> I, haven't, I, I have not been approached, no. Well, I think, um, you know, this sounds like this would be a good way for doing a timely <laughs> benchmark evaluation of the uh, status of uh, various drainage ditches. It's interesting. Thank you. Yes. 
So from start to finish, when the idea was first conceived and when you had the actionable data products available, mm -hmm. how long did it take? Uh, the survey basically took a day, uh, including, uh, we, had to, we had to do it over two days because of the weather, but we laid, we laid out the ground control points and shot the survey in about a day. Then it takes probably another few days to process the data, and then, then another day or so to pull it in, let's say a week. Can you comment on what the actual cost was? The, uh, well, again, it, it, it really varies. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so in this case, absent the cost of the equipment, what was the actual cost to the citizens? Well, th th this, this was, this was d done, well, for a couple reasons. One is I was, I, I was approached about doing it, and so I did it, I did it for grass. But I, I also got a lot out of this, too, so don't, don't get me wrong. Well, there's a, I'm not asking these for heck of us, but I mean, the, following up on Richard's question, <laughs> it sounds like that you wouldn't be doing it for gratis, but, no. but this sort of thing could be done quite easily, quite quickly. Mm -hmm. And so that's perhaps something that we should be thinking about. Yeah. That's, that's the beauty of this type of equipment. You know, there are limitations, don't get me wrong. You know, these drones are typically used batteries. Uh, and so there are some limitations just on the physical area you, you, would, you could do, but uh, they're very portable and very quick to, to get in the field and, and uh, get the results. Really. Had you been able to play that uh, fly-through video through the, uh, with the data, mm -hmm. what would you have seen that was different from a regular video? You know, I haven't, I, um, you, you'll see on the edges, I wish I could show the video, you, you'll see on the edges, the, the trees look fake, I mean not fake, they just don't look real. But the, so on a normal video, obviously everything would look real. But the data in the bayou and in the main channel looks as real and detailed as any video. And, uh, and so it's, mainly I showed it as, one more thing you can get out of the, the data. And, you know, for a group of people that, uh, you know, in terms of just visually seeing what these things look like, it's a great tool. You don't have to do any more flying, separate flying. You can, you can actually just create the video or the uh, 3D flyer movie right, right from the data. But it looks realistic. It looks like you're looking at, looks like you're looking at a video. Now that you have the capabilities and the software and the hardware, mm -hmm. um, what, what do you plan to do from here? Well, I, I'm, 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 I, I do a number of things. I do these aerial surveys. I also do uh, work with mining companies and do, in doing stockpile analysis. Um, uh, I work with a poppin a producer up in Arkansas. I go up once a quarter. I do surveys over all their assets, and I do all their volumetrics for them. Uh, they're a little public company. Uh, you can, you can, I'm working with Montgomery County as we speak, uh, over small projects, kind of doing before and after, and uh, basically as, as much as anything, the commissioner there that I work with, he wanted to have some way of showing the public how their, how their tax money is being spent, and they really, they really haven't had a good way to do that, so in the case of, uh, there's a, a little, um, a bayou area that they had to debunk, they call it demucking. And so we shot a, a really nice survey and a video before the demucking and, and it's in the process of being demucked now, we're gonna do the same thing afterward. And I could even, if I did this actual survey, I could actually tell you exactly what the difference is. I mean, even volume-wise. Yeah. Mike, what, um, closer, closer to your mouth and turn it on. Oh, okay. Mike, what type of uh, certifications or training do you need to be able to do this quote-unquote legally? So, I'm a convert, what's called a commercial pilot, so you have to get a, a FAA Part 107 license. Uh, it's not quite like being a, getting a pilot's license, but you, you do need to get it. Um, you can get it, typically if you can study for it, you need to study for it, because there's, there's a lot of overlap between a pilot's license and a drone pilot's license. And uh, once you get the commercial license, 
That's really the only requirement, but the FAA has a lot of requirements that, that on the commercial side. And you gotta know the rules and regulations, you gotta pay attention to the airspace, just like the previous speaker talked about. The, the, you know, you, you, even though we may not be covering as broad an area, you still gotta know if there are airspace issues in, that, in the area you're shooting, and if there are, you gotta deal with them. You gotta call the airports, or you gotta get waivers. Uh, so there's, there's a fair amount involved. You know, in terms of the surveying part, I'm not a licensed surveyor. I use the surveying equipment basically to do the ground control points. But the, but the data that comes, if you do it right, the results, the accuracy of the data that comes out of these drones is very, very good. You know, for planning purposes and, and so forth. And the slick thing is the data can be put right into a GIS application. And it's, it's really, I, I, I find it fun, you know, in a sense. I have one more question. Right. Mike, I was just going to say, you, you, it was asked earlier about uh, what Harris County Flood Control feels right. about this. I just want to add, I think right now, uh, the flood control is looking at Harris County as a big animal. Right. So LIDAR is, is kind of the gold standard right. for them on a big scale. But I think the evolution of the drone and Mike's capability to show that it's a very useful tool, especially for smaller projects. And in some cases, you want to look at that smaller level. So uh, it, was, it was fun working with Mike on the project. And, and I think it showed our point about the concern that water through the bypass is not working as efficiently as, as it was designed originally. And I would hope that over time, uh, with battery generation too, uh, it will develop longer lives. And, with time, maybe Harris County Flood Control will start using it more. So it's certainly cheaper, I think, uh, right. for some of these projects. Yeah, I mean, this this drone business, this is just beginning. I mean, there's going to be drones for lots of different things. And the technology, the battery technology, you know, they're going to, they have, they have uh, quadcopters, they have fixed wing drones, and they have what are called VTOLs, or hybrid drones, which are vertical takeoff and landing. You know, you're going to be able to do larger and larger and larger areas with these with these drones. Oh, sorry. Mike, I appreciate it.